Friends, this morning we have a special guest with us, and I'm not going to introduce him specifically, but I do want to introduce uh, one of our pastors in our fellowship of churches across the nation, the Fellowship of Evangelical Churches, Baptist Churches in Canada. This is Jack Hanna, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Can you welcome Jack and our speaker this morning? Thank you for the opportunity of uh, being here and introducing uh, John uh, to you. First of all, I want to commend you as a congregation and your leadership for being willing to deal with this particular issue. The reason why so many of our young adults are going away from the church is because they're struggling with this particular issue, and I'm afraid that some of our churches are not really uh, dealing uh, with it. I want to introduce to you our special speaker this morning, uh, John uh, Mackay. John Mackay came to know the Lord as a result of reading a secular science book. But he couldn't find the answers, as, as a matter of fact, about life and about God. And so uh, uh, he began a search, and it led him to a personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he's given his life to the Lord uh, and to the ministry of Creation Research. He is the international director of Creation Research. Unfortunately, he's from Australia, and you'll find out about that in a minute or two when you try to understand him. The poor Mandarin guy that's going to have to translate for him. In the... uh, anyways, um, John has been used all around the world uh, in this particular area uh, and has been involved in uh, debates, even debated Richard Dawkins, the outstanding, well-known atheist. John tells me that he won that debate uh, why wouldn't he? But poor Richard. Uh, John had God on his side. Well, it was easy for him to win that uh, particular uh, debate. And God has used John uh, in this area to help our churches, and he's going to help today us as uh, he brings uh, God's uh, word uh, to you. And may God bless him uh, as he comes. Please uh, welcome uh, John Mackay. Now, it's about 10 years since I've been uh, to this church, and it's certainly evolved a lot since I was here last. I don't think that's the right word, is it? Um, outside in the foyer, if you want to come and chat to me, I do need to give you a warning. I blew both eardrums a little while ago, and I've only got half hearing back in that ear. So if I totally ignore you, I apologize in advance. It's just that I can't hear what you say. And as I said to Pastor John as we prayed, for the first time in my life, I'm officially authorized to keep my eyes open during prayer so I know when you're done. Um, it's difficult, and I've really gained an appreciation of the struggles deaf people have. And if you're wondering about hearing aids for busted eardrums, they're no use at all, uh, so the medicos tell me. So just keep praying that I'll get my ears back because I'm supposed to do a Q&A with the young people today. I will need someone to translate from Canadian into English and then into Australian and tell me what on earth was being said. So uh, perhaps they can do that for the Mandarin group. That would be great. You can see our topic today, Christ words, Christ work, and uh, I've emphasized the research part of our website, creationresearch.net. Uh, you may have questions and you're troubled with this half-deaf speaker. We've got hundreds of questions answered on that website, including one that's just come up this week. I preached up at Oshawa on Wednesday and there's a big homosexual issue up there. And immediately after I'd preached there, even though I barely even touched on that subject, somebody pasted something on our website. Uh, if you want to see the answer to what they said, and they have a very antagonistic attitude to Christianity. So that will be pasted on the Q&A website for this Wednesday. Um, okay, Christ words, Christ work, creationresearch.net. IQ question to start with. Who said this? Now, I can't hear you if you answer me, but, you know, I can read lips a little bit. Um, beware of false science. It leads you astray. Well, the answer is I said that, because that's my version of what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy. And it's a pretty good rendition, because I have many people who are led astray by false theology, false politics, false physics, false chemistry. Yes, you see, the old King James used the word science, and in Greek, it's gnosis, just means knowledge. 
knowledge about politics, knowledge about education, knowledge about physics, chemistry, biology, the age of the earth. Watch out for any false information. It will lead you astray. You still see that word used in conscience. Uh, you know, mum says, don't eat the jelly beans before you have supper. And you sneak in and you steal a jelly bean and you immediately feel bad. You didn't get caught, but you feel bad because you did it con science. Oh, remember your old Greek and Latin roots? Con means with, science means knowledge. With knowledge. Watch out for false science. It leads you astray. No, Timothy was not a young PhD graduate in physics. Timothy was an ordinary bloke, as we'd say in Australia. But Paul expected him to know the difference between good knowledge and bad knowledge. And any Christian can do this easily because you've been given God's word who is good. And he tells you if you lack wisdom, ask, and it will be given to you abundantly. Our subject today is all about who is your authority when it comes to deciding good knowledge from bad knowledge. Um, we could spend hours on this topic. We could run whole week-long conferences, but I've got till 10.15, they tell me. Let's see what we can achieve. I'm going to try and do two parts. One deals with the sort of research side, as we emphasized in our website, and the other deals with a little reminder of God's Word. I haven't been here for 10 years, so I said to Pastor John, do we have new people? Um, yes, yes, uh, particularly in the second service. So I'm going to do the first part, which is watch out for good science and bad science, a bit on the research, and the second part, the knowledge that you and I find in God's Word. A little bit of the knowledge about science um, from the general public. You've heard of Fox TV? A little bit on the right side of centre, aren't they? Out of the USA. Uh, just a month ago, they had a report on that topic. Well, Fox News just publicised it. There's a group in the USA called the Pew Research Centre, and it actually reports on church trends of all sorts. And this one caught Fox's attention because it was a report on why young people are leaving the church. But not just becoming Hindus, not just becoming Buddhists, they're becoming nothings. They don't believe any alternatives. They just simply don't believe anything. They do that because of the large role evolution has played in their non-belief. Now, I did a big debate a few years ago at Guelph University against a professor there who claimed to be an atheist. And again, it was sad to see um, because, you see, there are many students in that university who would have thought this guy was way up there giving them information that was so valuable and so up to date. No, the theory of evolution is about how we came from nowhere and we're going nowhere. There's nobody out there. There's no purpose. Hydrogen is a colorless, odorless gas, which, given long enough, turned into Pastor John Mahaffey. And the hydrogen doesn't know why, and he doesn't know why. Right? They are, are believing nothing because of the role that evolution has played. I meet these young people all the time. I meet them in universities. I meet them in colleges. I meet them in schools. I meet them in churches and do our best to make sure, hey, where you are going, you've been led astray by false science. Of course, the opposite is true too. There are young people who've been pointed to Christ because of true science, true knowledge. Uh, I'm one of them. As Pastor um, said, I, I, I became a Christian through reading a textbook by an atheist. God does have a sense of humor. And he was poking fun at God, well, the God who didn't exist, and he was trying to prove God didn't exist. Now, I don't know if you've studied philosophy. It's hard enough to prove something is. You try and prove something isn't. And I thought to myself, this guy may have three PhDs, but he's a moron. Philosophically, he's an idiot. You know, that was before I'd even read the Bible because the next portion of his book was all about how the Bible's just a lot of fables and myths and legends. And you know, as I read his arguments there, they were just as stupid. So I picked up a Bible to see what it said. And there's the Holy Spirit saying, come on, I'm reeling you in. I've got you. You're on the hook now. And he did. And it was only after that that I discovered, what's the psalmist say? Only the fool 
says in his heart, there is no God. The professor who wrote this science textbook was a highly intelligent fool. Intelligence? Or you can be a foolish person who's very intelligent. You're just not wise. There's a big difference. Hmm. Where are we? Not in Canada. England. And you see the arrow? I run field trips all around the world and I know Pastor John and, and, and other pastors have prayed for years that the Lord would raise up somebody we could train to replace me. Here's the young man. Um, do, you, do you see that nice dinosaur skull he's got? Uh, that's Joseph Hubbard. You can pray for him. He's the next creation guy, John Mackay, for sure. And he and I were on a field trip. You see, I learned ages ago the Bible does say the rocks will cry out the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm, what are we looking for? Oh, I love bashing rocks. Keeps me moderately healthy in my middle to old age, despite busted eardrums. Um, can you see the hammer, the chisel? Good exercise. Can you see the fossil scallop shell? Now, these rocks are supposed to be 150 million years old, Nelly. You know, if you believe that, you've just proved that scallops have only turned into scallops. Uh, that's why I abandoned evolution, by the way. There isn't the slightest evidence that things have done anything but produce their own kind. But the rocks are also interesting because they're full of things that you have never seen alive. Oh, do you see the bone there? You see, this turned out to be the start of a dinosaur rib cage. Yep, rib after rib. And can you spot it? Oh, this was exciting. I'm glad I don't need glasses to see you in the morning. It really helps to actually spot what's in the rocks. Can you spot it yet? The start of a jaw with the teeth. Hmm, dinosaurs. Where do they fit into all of this? How does it all work together? Watch out for false knowledge. Who is your authority? The professor who keeps changing his theories or God's word, which has stayed the same ever since I've read it. And now that you can access the Septuagint on the internet, you'll find it says the same thing there nearly 3,000 years ago. Well, two and a bit thousand years ago anyway. Hmm. There's young Joseph. We recently took him to Australia for 10 weeks to teach him that there are other countries that think they speak English. But he really needs to watch how he preaches because some words actually have a... Sl you, you've noticed that in Canada, haven't you? Hmm. Uh, that's my grandson on the left-hand side, by the way. A and the good news is both of them are single. And if you're interested, ladies, talk to me later. Um, <laughs> we are looking for potential candidates there. But do you spot the T-shirts? These were creatively des designed. They didn't happen by themselves. No wonder Paul says the evidence of God's handiwork is so clear. Everybody can see it. Not a single person at the University of Guelph will believe those T-shirts happen by themselves despite the fact they may believe the message which contradicts what's on these t-shirts. Yep, these t-shirts will be out the front. You'll see Martin out there wearing them. Oh, the top bit is just borrowed off the net. It's been out there copyright free for ages. It's meant to be a bit of a joke. Stop following you monkeys and apes and gorillas. That's as far as it goes. Cute. And we thought, we can do better than that. Stop following me. We're not related. You see, you and I live in a world where the university students here, Guelph, Toronto, are largely bombasted with, we're related to the monkeys. They're your relatives. Behave like them. You're just another animal. There was no Adam created. No, stop following us. We're not related. God created man in his image. And this God actually has given you a brain and he tells you, come, test me, try me today. You realize he doesn't worry about you testing anything he said? Because he never lies to you. Every test you put on it will show that he's telling you the truth. And when he came to earth, he said, I am the way, I am the truth. Hmm. Hey, you can get these out there. If you're into T-shirts, I'm not sure people wear too many T-shirts with the snow out the front there. But, you know, you can wear them inside. It's great. Yes, research, rocks that cry up the praise of God. Uh, just on the border of Queensland and the Northern Territory, we've got a dinosaur dig out there near the edge of the desert, and we've made some fabulous dinosaur finds. You know, you don't dig them up with labels on. It'd be wonderful if you did where it said, Hi, I'm Struthi Arminus. I was here 100 million years ago. No, they're just bones. 
And the rest of what you read in museums is story. A story that will be accepting of God's word as authority or a story that will be rejecting of God's word as authority. Take your choice. Choose this day who you will serve, said Joshua. And I'm sure Pastor John says the same thing every week to you in one way or another. You know, we were blessed by finding a world expert because we struggled with these bones for several years. You know, you find a dinosaur skull, it's easy to recognize. You even find a big hip bone and it's easy to recognize. Find a tooth and it's fairly simple to do. Find a tailbone. We got bags and bags of tailbone. So this guy was big. But the trouble was we were puzzled. We couldn't match it to anything. Then the Lord provided us an expert who's a consultant for the British Natural History Museum and his specialty, he goes to museum basements all over the world and he finds the bones that have no labels, no identification on, just bits and pieces. And he's become a world expert. You know, when we found that we couldn't identify these, we said, Lord, send us somebody who's smarter than us in this area. You do pray like that, don't you? If you lack wisdom, ask, and it will be given to you by the God who gives generously. That, that's, the, that's the recipe for wisdom, not the recipe for intelligence. You can blame your mum and dad for your intelligence, or you can pat them on the... Actually, don't blame them. Go back and blame Adam and everything that's happened since then. Hmm. We'd found a titanosaur. Hey, you want to help us fund the rest of the expedition? We, we've got the skull out there too. Totally inaccessible. You need a helicopter. No, you can't land a helicopter because it's on a slope like that. You can't drive there. There's no roads. Pick and shovel and backs is about it. No little quadmobiles can get there out in the edge of the desert. But you know what's interesting? We found that too. What is it? World expert again. You found a plesiosaur tail. Hey? Big land creature, big sea creature together. I wonder how you could explain that. Take your choice. Charles Darwin, millions of years, the professor at Guelph, vast amounts of evolution from colorless, odorless gas, right up professors who tell you about it. How would you explain this? God's word, in the beginning he created, Noah's flood, sin, the judgment. You know, when you find land creatures buried with sea creatures, you're looking at some kind of a flood deposit. But how big? How big is your imagination for uh, accepting God's word that he covered the whole world with a flood? Are you brave enough to do that? I mean, the first time I took Brother John and his wife out, we did a fossil dig. Remember that? And we found some fossils. I wonder what your explanation is. How do you see the rocks crying out the praises of God? Who is your authority? The word of God who was there or the opinions of men who weren't? You know, it's interesting. Not too long ago, they found a baby titanosaur. See the diagram? There's the reference there. Every week or two, we produce the latest scientific research and get it out to you people in readable form. Hey, 2016, this is not long ago. Do you see the little baby titanosaur? There's mummy titanosaur. Big, eh? And impressive. And that's what strikes most people. And most people don't realize... Noah would have had no trouble fitting dinosaurs in the ark. Why do you think he had to take big animals? Why, why, why did you think that? That's because the little golden story book that had the story of Noah's ark in always painted adult giraffes and adult elephants and not once did you or I stop to check what God's word says. It never says God sent two of every adult kind of animal. The God who knew how big to tell Noah to build the ark was wise enough to send everything small enough to actually fit. And the skeptic, he struggles with that. You see, there's my conclusion after many years of studies. It's not the evidence which contradicts the word of God, but the opinions of men. Always. You check, you think, you use the mind that God gave you. You will love me with your heart, your soul, and your mind, said Jesus. And most of us don't mind the heart bit. It gives you a warm feeling. Don't mind the soul bit. That's our fire insurance policy against hell. The brain bit, hard work, study to show yourself approved. Young Joseph, yep, here we are in the centre of Australia. It's a bit dry out there. We did find a bit of water. Lovely reflections in water, aren't they? And plants and that could grow there. And Jesus is the water of life. But out there, there's not much of it. 
um, we got Joseph to climb up to the top of the big red rock in the middle you know the famous one come out you need to, if you want to climb it get there before October next year because they're shutting it down then apparently here he is right up the top you know we were funded to go out there by a local group in Alice Springs um, sort of the most isolated town in the center of Australia and they told us when we got down from there they said when you get back into Alice we want you to give a talk on how did Ayers Rock get there and I said you could have told us that before we even came here so we could have done some research oh we well, have climbed it now we want a, a public lecture on how Ayers Rock got there oh hmm and, and the Olgas by the way there's the other big rock 35 kilometers away and I thought hmm what do we do here well the interesting thing of course is I did have a memory of one of my friends who became a Bible believer because his professor was actually a world expert on Ayers Rock Uluru as it's now politically called Professor Twilder and he said we've got a real problem in Australia out in the middle of the desert there are two lots of rocks huge rocks they've been eaten up by water picked up dumped by water and eroded off by water in the middle of the desert how do you explain it hey would you like to suggest we go somewhere near Noah's flood because here in Canada you will find if you dare suggest that at university this is the sort of reaction you got because quote unquote this is actually what happened excuse me sir oh who asked the question a guy who'd been raised in brethren circles you know fairly insular isolated excuse me sir why haven't we discussed Noah's flood this year now how do you think the geology professor reacted I'll tell you McDonald if you're going to ask stupid questions like that take an arts course how's that for a downer on arts scientists think arts people just mess around oh you know that student never asked another question in education you can lie by simply not allowing certain questions to be asked and that's how it's mostly done oh what would your answer be God created the world covered by water God destroyed the world with water and that might be a good starting point are you brave enough to do that watch out for false science it will lead you astray God was there the professor wasn't you see false science leads people astray and it leads you away from Christ and there's no doubt about it whether your name is Joseph or whether your name is the guy I'm just about to introduce you to true knowledge leads you to Christ now I've always been encouraged at this church because your desire is not just to fill up pews by borrowing people from other churches but to see people saved and I tell you what John and I share that aim we've got a mutual friend a missionary from years and years ago uh, out in the Philippines wasn't it you met Wes I think and uh, the interesting thing of course is Peter has now been added to the kingdom of God how you see this is not just an interesting side issue this is an absolutely basic issue if you look at the Pew report why are young people not old people they can cope a bit better with this the young people think hey if Genesis 1 is not true John 1 is not true if Genesis 3 is not true John 3 is not true oh why am I here I, if evolution is true there's nothing we came from nothing we're going to why should I believe anything Peter um, uh, he'd calmed down by then by the way Peter is an Aussie I met him on the trip where Joseph and I were traveling through the Blue Mountains and you see most people have left the meeting Peter came up to me and he said can I talk I said sure and then he burst into tears now Aussie men don't do that and I thought what have I got a kook do I need a counselor how about a psychologist um, what's going on here and when he calmed down he said I just want to tell you how happy I am because because last time you came through town I was a rebel against God I would not believe the Bible I rejected what the pastor said because evolution was true and he said you demolished every argument I had so what choice did I have except to become a Christian I loved his logic don't you if A is not true B must be if A says there's no God and B says Jesus is God I'm going there Peter's now a Christian rejoice with him rejoice with me but don't be surprised at his reaction the first time I came to this church many many years ago when you had the old building I preached on that 
I know some of you were here then, but you can't remember it. That's all right. I've got it on PowerPoint these days. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, said Jesus. Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Psalm 90. If you believe that, you'd believe me. You know, as a young geologist, a lecturer in geology, that's a verse you struggle with. Moses said, God made the world in six days. Moses says, hey, Genesis, God made the world good. Sin came in. Look at the problems that have happened since. Moses wrote about me, but if you don't believe what Moses wrote, how can you believe me? Turn it around, you people. If you're a Christian and you claim to believe in Jesus Christ, he just committed you to believing the word of God from the beginning. Hmm, you may have to struggle with it. There's still parts of it I struggle with. And at the moment, the young people at that, that, that meeting up at Osho this week, homosexuality in Leviticus, and that is what the question was thrown at us about. A tough one. Hmm. Do you believe what Moses wrote? Interesting. Uh, one last thing before we give you a challenge from Genesis 1 and John 1. Quebec, Canada, you've heard of it? Because it's famous for that fossil. Yes, I have a specimen from there. It's called Sordonia because it looks like a saw. That's how scientists do it, by the way. It's, it's just said in Latin usually. Um, found in Quebec and it's claimed to be 350 million years old. Now that's older than Pastor Jack and me put together. That's supposed to be really old. Now I'll be blunt. Many young people think if that's how old the world is, the Bible isn't true. And their logic is indisputable. Because when I first read the Bible, you know what struck me? It's all about a world made in six days. And I see no evidence Adam was here six million years ago or 60,000 years ago. Or oh, Sordonia, a fossil thorn, land plant. I was just down in Carthage, USA, and they didn't have any white stuff down there. But uh, I did find this, another specimen of Sordonia. But it's in rocks that are supposed to be 450 million years old. Now, I hate to rub it in, but you see, we've now got the record from the USA. Uh, I don't believe those millions of years, by the way. And it's just the way they stack up the rocks. But do you realize there are fossil thorns in the rocks? Because fossil thorns, land plants, fossil thorns, supposedly older by 100 million years, land plants. You say, why would he even tell you this? Why does he get so excited about rocks with thorns in? I'll tell you why. The Bible has a particular history of thorns. Have you noticed that? God said to Adam, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And the trouble is, Adam did, correct? And then God came along in chapter 3 and he said he cursed the ground. And he actually said it would bring forth thorns. God made the world good. Adam sinned. Thorns, thistles, and death are the result. Keep that in mind. Oh, when it comes to geology, how do you see things? Who is your authority? The word of God who was there or the opinions of men who weren't? You see, the Bible's not just a history of spiritual salvation. It's a history of physical thorns. If you believe that, hey, can you imagine me at a geology conference saying, hey, guys, I now hold the world record. Praise Jesus for that. Or they'd probably drop dead at that statement, wouldn't they? Uh, there we are we're right down near the bottom and we found fossil thorns all the way up come on think think you'll love God with your brains you will love him with your heart and your mind those rocks there only formed after Adam sinned ah think study show yourself approved do you believe what I say you remember when the king found the law? He was amazed. What he thought was right wasn't right at all. And he knew that because God had revealed what was right. There were no thorns on planet earth till after Adam sinned. Do you actually believe that? Or have I touched a sore spot? Because here's how important it is. What's he got on his head? Who's this a pictorial representation of? Isn't that Jesus Christ? Uh, he has thorns on his head. Why? Because he came to deal with sin. He died because sin and death go together. He had thorns on his head because death and sin and thorns are like that. Oh, let's finish off in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. If you've got your Bibles there, open them up at Genesis 1. Hey, this is going to be the quickest journey from Genesis to John you've ever had, but it's important. 
The first three words, first four words in English, by the way, in the beginning God did what? Good. You don't even need to look it up, do you? Um, now, while you've got Genesis open, think carefully what John's Gospel says. In the beginning was the? And the Word was with God, and the Word was? Do you realize the Holy Spirit has just taken almost a paragraph to say the first four words of Genesis chapter 1? And, and then by the time you get down to verse 3 of John's Gospel, it says, By him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that was made. And then you get down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in chapter 2, it tells you Jesus was at the wedding of Cana, where he spoke and water turned into wine. Okay, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. But now you have a name. Do you realize it took 14 verses to fill in the first four words of Genesis chapter 1? The Holy Spirit is no undeniably expanding the information. Why? In the beginning, God... You know, most Christians see God as a name, but it isn't. God is a position. Uh, oh Lord, you are our God, says the psalmist. And it goes right over our head. Because their God could have been Vishnu. Their God could have been Allah. Their God could have been money. Their God could have been anything. But the Lord Jehovah, uh, that's the old Hebrew pronunciation. Yahweh, if you like, the newer Hebrew pronunciation. But when he, as God, became flesh... The angel said, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then he dies on a cross and on his head is thorns. In the beginning, God. You know, if that was all you had, you wouldn't know who it was referring to. You'd just know there was somebody at the top. You could have been in India and you could have had 300 million people at the top or things or spirits, whatever you want to call them. I know that because I had a Hindu come to one of my university meetings and, and I've been to India as well and found the same problem and this young man came after I'd won a debate at Monash University and he said, who is this God you're talking about? Yeah, you see, don't assume everyone thinks God is Jesus. You live in a multicultural Canada, you need to deal with Muslims who know that God is not Jesus according to their theology. Okay, who, who is this God you talk about? So I said, it's Jesus. Oh, what is he like? So I told him, hey, can you do that? Just a couple of points, the way, the truth, the light. Jesus is love. Jesus is the sacrifice. You know, when I finished, he said, oh, this sounds very good. I would like this God. I will add him to all of mine. I said, you cannot do that. He said, why not? I said, listen to what this God says. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There is no other way to the Father except through me. And he died on a cross with thorns on his head. Hmm. You know, that young man could have become a Christian that moment, but he went away saying, Oh, I do not like that. I do not like that. That's Jesus' claim, isn't it? One God, and it's him. And he is the only way to the Godhead. There is no other way. And he is the creator. You caught that, didn't you? The Christ on the cross is the creator. All things are made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Tie it together for you. Genesis 1, God created. Go to verse 31 quickly. We've got about four minutes left. Let's see if we can do it. Genesis 1, 31. And God saw all that he made, and it was very good. You realize that's the last time God ever called the world good? I mean, I, I was talking to one of my friends in Tennessee and I told them there's this white stuff everywhere and they said, oh, isn't it wonderful? I said, no, it's ridiculous. You can die in this stuff. You get frostbite. Um, it can kill you. It may be pretty, but to an Australian, look, me, it's pretty awful. Um, you know, interesting thing is, Genesis 1.31 is the last time God ever called the world good. You need to note that because in Genesis 3, man sinned. And the world went from good to not so good. And then God judged the world at Noah's flood. And it went from not so good to pretty bad. And winter and summer and ice and snow appear in Job. The climate, uh, climate change is old as one thing, starting from Noah's flood. 
don't give scientists the credit for discovering that. It's been around ever since God judged. And the world's been going down, down, down because we sinned. And then God himself comes as the man Jesus dies on a cross with thorns on his head. And what's your favorite verse in John 3? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but yes I've got it in King James because that's the only Bible I had when, when I finished reading that atheist science book yeah so it's up there God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life like that bloke last week said now I've got eternal life hug me no I mean hug John that's right um that's, that's fabulous. It's great news, really encouraging. Okay, John 1, or Genesis 1, God made the world good. John 1, the good God became a good man and never sinned. Genesis 3, man sinned. John 3, the good God took our sin, and it's good news. You no longer have to pay the price because he's paid it. Can I be brutally blunt? Yes, you can go outside, you can see Martin, you can get our DVDs on MP3s and MP4s and all those fancy newfangled things. You can talk to Martin about getting T-shirts. I think he even takes your credit card with those slip things here. Um, but do you know something? When you go out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, remember, he is the creator. He's the one who made the world good. And he's the one who paid the price. When you know this, you, can, you know the whole gospel. The trouble is, so does the devil. And he knows very well, if he can undermine Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in the eyes of all Canadians, he has got you stuffed when it comes to sharing John 1, 2, and 3. Don't try and pretend you're just going to preach the New Testament gospel. There's no such thing. The good news starts in chapter 1 of Genesis. God made the world. It never happened by itself. We were made in his image. You are not an animal. He made it very good. Don't blame him for the problems you've got. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and look in a mirror and then rejoice that he came as a good man who kept the law all the time so you'd know he was the saviour and then he died in your place with thorns on his head so pray for us as we do the research you want to support what we do talk to martin he'll tell you how to do that and visit our museum here in canada you mightn't have even known we've got one but we do okay over to whoever's taking over back from me again and uh, i'll see you out there in the foyer for a little while let me just close in prayer a reminder that uh, young adults if you want to come back for lunch um, take a break, come back, join us for a question and answer time with uh, Dr. Mackay, and we're looking forward to that. And for the rest of us, as we go into this world, uh, the word that really struck me was hopelessness. So many people argue about details, but the condition of their heart, that question of do you have hope or no hope at all, is one that we can answer so clearly. If you haven't found that hope yourself and you'd like to talk to someone, take the time. God is a God who has created us to know him, to have the hope of knowing him eternally, and we want to praise him for that. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for all that you've shared with us today through your word and through your servant. Father, we pray that as we go into this world that you've created, as we meet those whom you love, Father, that we would be bold to tell them of the hope that we have, the hope that you have given us, the hope that is based on the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.